Hello everybody to a brand new Let's Play series in Hearts of Iron 4, Kaiserreich. Today, we we're playing a South African. You may have noticed that this is an actual YouTube video. This is not a Twitch VOD. It's an actual YouTube video, which I know is in, in crazy. Because I don't know last time we've actually have done a Hoi 4 YouTube video. We did a little bit of the CK2 stuff that was YouTube. And again, we're going to be doing a little bit more of that um, coming up this week. But there's been a new update for Kaiserreich. Uh, mainly is we have like officer cores here now that actually work. We can choose advisors. That used to be in the game many, many years ago. Uh, they took it out for, I don't actually know why they took it out, but they took it out. They've added it back in. That's nice. That's nice to know. Well, we're playing in South Africa. They got a re-amped uh, focus tree. We are just going to be doing the basic Entente route. Cause we've done socialist South Africa before. But this time, we're just going to go simple, simple Entente route. Uh, this isn't available. It's going to be Army and Navy experience. I will take that. How many trains do we have? Five. You know what? Just for right away, I'm just going to take these 15 trains. And we're going to go with all of our basic technologies here. Construction, production, efficiency, as well as research. Our industry right now, we're at 319. I'm going to go one military factory for for now. Put that in Cape Town. Don't worry about you. Don't worry about you. Don't worry about any of these right now. 18 steel is not bad. Actually, what do we have in terms of resources? We got a lot of chromium. Very little steel. A little bit of tungsten and nothing else. And we have free military factories. Probably just put that on rifles for now. We have five units. I'm pretty sure they're all essentially garbage. I'm not going to worry about that now. Let's put you guys around Cape Town. And now you can see in the officer core, you can actually assign roles now. So that's nice. It's nice that they finally have gone around to uh, adding that into the game. We actually were missing steel. Do I want to import steel right away? Oz, I think the answer is actually yes. Let's get that going. And I guess we'll just put support equipment in here for now, even if we're not going to be building it right away. Okay, so the Union of South Africa, formed in 1910, it's a merger of the various British possessions in South Africa, the Cape Colony, the tall Transvaal and the Orange Free State, after the Second World War. The Union of South Africa remains as the last remnants of the British presence in Africa. But the Dominion is wavering. The white Afrikaner population years back for the independence of the Boer Republics of old, while on the other side of the political spectrum, syndicalists, already influential in the region since before the coming of France or the Union of Britain materialized, is creeping into the minds of the impoverished underclass of every racial group who are chafing under the effects of the economic downturn. The Union's politics revolve around a two-party system, the South African Party of General Hans Smut and the National Party of General J.B.M. Herzog. A smaller party, the Labour Party, currently divided into two opposing factions, also holds a presence in the South African Parliament. Between 1924 and 1929, they ruled with the National Party and the coalition government, but after their failure to tame the Great Depression, the South African Party secured a majority again. First with the help of breakaway nationalists, and then after 1933, after being credited with, uh, for relieving the effects of the Great Depression on its own. Right now, we do have the Social Conservatives. They are the SAP, which I believe are... Pro Entente? I think it's the authoritarian Democrats that are pro Reichspact, or at least anti Entente. Oh, yeah, another major change I probably should talk about before we actually get uh, going in here is the change of the world tension. World tension now is substantially more important. Because if you remember before in Kaiserreich, world tension didn't mean anything at all, essentially. I mean, I guess you could generate war goals. Actually, you might. Are you actually. In, am I, wait, am I a puppet? No. No, yeah, there it is. Generate world, uh, world tension. For a second, Valkyrie starts. War goals can only be gained by national focuses. Okay, that's actually changed. But if we go to, let's say, the Commune of France. And if you remember before, when it comes to taking down Germany, which actually now actually is not called uh, the Man of the Rain, it's just take down Germany. Uh, it used to happen in June 14, 1939. That's not actually quite the case anymore. It can either happen on August 1st, 1940, or when world tension is 75%. So, I, I don't know when that will be. So, you know, no longer are we kind of guaranteed a start to the Second Field of the Creek starting in September, August, September 39. 
Now it's a little bit more variable. You know, it's hard to say exactly when that war will break out. So we'll kind of see how that plays into the game. Because, I mean, it, it can change a lot. It, it can change the way you kind of think about all of these events. When you should prepare for the war. You know, it's, it's a little different now. But anyways, continuing on with our with our lore here. Race in South Africa. South Africa's population is perhaps the most diverse in all of Africa. But racism and segregation are institutionalized and omnipresent. The white European population forms the top of South Africa's racial hierarchy. They hold socioeconomic power in the nation and force a degree of segregation throughout South Africa. The group is divided between the Afrikaners, the descendants of Dutch colonists who arrived in Cape Colony during Dutch rule, who hold political power owing to being a majority of the almost exclusively white electorate, and the British South Africans, English-speaking descendants of colonists who arrived in the 19th century, who hold most economic power, although this is shifting somewhat to the Afrikaner advantage in recent years. The non-white population, the so-called colored community, enjoys the most respect. This group made up of people of mixed heritage, and most of them speak Afrikaans, the same language as the white Afrikaners. They make a majority of the population in the Western Cape provinces, and make up the largest part of non-white property-based uh, voters in that same province as well as in South Rhodesia. And then there's the Asiatic group, South Africans of Asian descent. The majority of this group uh, are former indentured workers from British India, or their descendants who live pr primarily in Natal, and to a smaller extent, Transvaal. In the Cape, one can find uh, the Cape Malays, who were brought here from the Maritime Southeast Asia by the Dutch in the 17th and 18th centuries. The least respected are the original native Black Africans. Most of them belong to one of the several Bantu people, the Xhosa, the Zulu, the Sothu, or one of the smaller tribal groups. Despite making a majority of South Africa's population by far, they have very little political power, even in the provinces where non-whites can theoretically vote. But very few of them fulfill the need of property requirements. With an entrenched white electorate, hopes for reform are dim. We could train some more units. You have no guns. So you know what? For now, we won't we won't worry about that. And the South African Act. The South African Act of 1909 passed by Westminster serves as the Union's constitution. The Union of South Africa is a unitary state rather than a federation, with each colony's parliaments abolished and replaced with the provincial councils. The National Parliament consists of two parts, the Volksrat and the Senate. The Volksrat members are elected mostly by the country's white minority under the first past the post, although the franchisee uh, franchise varies depending upon the province. In the cave in South Rhodesia, a qualified franchisee uh, based upon property and education requirements is in place, while the vote is uh, whites only everywhere else. The Senate is appointed by the Electoral College, consisting of members of each of the five provincial councils and members of the Volksrat. The government follows the Westminster model and is appointed by the Governor General of South Africa, presently the Earl of Clarendon. South Africa has been administering Bushland, Bosterland, and Swaziland as protections in place of Britain ever since the British Revolution in the 1920s. Also, Rhodesia has been admitted as a province of the Union in 1922. So where do we... I, I see that we don't have enough manpower. So we don't have in Botswana... I'm guessing, yeah, you're still in your oversight. If you just go to local police force, usually that's a little bit better for us. So what are we missing? We're missing guns. 37 rifles. I mean, that's not so bad. Also, I guess we won't have you here. Let's just put you on the border in the north. Not that I think we'll be going to war with Middle Africa anytime soon, but just as a precautionary measure. Just, just in case. The passing of King George V. The King of Great Britain and Ireland and Emperor of India, George V, has passed away in exile in Canada. Only well, Canada preparations are made for the funeral and the ascension of his eldest son Edward to the thrones of the Dominions, South Africa included. In the theoretical throne of Great Britain, life goes on in South Africa. With most of the African population passively or actively pursuing a republic and a native, colored, and Asiatic communities largely indifferent to a phone or monarchy seated thousands of miles away. Morning over late, King reigns mostly confined to the English-speaking white population and a more or less obligatory procedures for the Dominion government, like declaring a state of mourning and hanging the national flag at half-mast on public property. So because we're a social conservative, this means we can only assign social conservatives. Actually, do these guys not have... Oh, they might not have parties anymore. The only party is out there during pandemic. National populism. I'm assuming some of these can only be if you're socialist as well. Yes. Okay, so there's kind of like three. There's like the liberal politicians, the reactionary politicians, and the revolutionary politicians, which is typically how Kaiserreich sorts out the 
uh, different ideological groups here. Port Elizabeth North by election. South African People uh, Party representative in the Volkswagen for Port Elizabeth North, Charles F. Kaiser, has passed away last year. Even if the con constituency cannot be left unrepresented, a by election is being organized. The seat is evidently desired because there are four prospective candidates. The SAP evidently wants to defend its continuity, but uh, madly Labour and National the opportunity to snatch a seat. Leader of the Fringe, also the advert button and spider of White Workers' Party, Louis Weimark, is anti-Semitic and saucy pro-German. German South African uh, has also made a bid for the seat. Okay, so let us go. We can go SAP to go so Labor. You know, we'll just have uh, the conservatives stay in power. We don't we don't usually go conservative very often in these campaigns. We can go. Uh, we, might, we might just stay conservative here. South African Trade and Labor Council. Established in 1930, the South African Trade and Labor Council, the SATLC, is the largest unified trade union body in the whole country. It was originally merged between two other historical trade union federations. The first was the South African Trade Union Council, which was formed in the wake of the 1924 Industrial Consolidation Act and represented white workers, becoming known for its rage, uh, radical leadership under Labor Party members William Henry, Bill Andrews, and James Jimmy Briggs who are today part of the manly uh, faction of the party. The second is the far older Cape Federation of Labor Unions, founded originally in 1933, designed both the white and colored workers along the coast. It was led by trade union veteran Robert Barr Stewart. The SATLC formed one of the, from these two entities. It's more or less dominated by the old trade union council, with a heavy focus on the white worker and the moderate politics of the Labor Party. Ideologically, there is a strong reformationist belief among the worker or the union rank and file, but the inner bureaucracy of the SATLC is known to be under the sway of the more radical, popular trade union leaders who manage to who manage the organizing efforts. A few of the leaders in the SATLC's affiliated trade unions are also well known to harbor racist views, while the average white South African worker and union member typically leans towards a moderate or extreme social attitudes on race. The key members of the SATLC's leadership, such as Andrews, have expressed hope for mending South Africa's racial struggles through the new radical pol or new yeah new radical policy of parallel unionism, hoping to one day unify black and colored workers under their own separate but equal system of trade unions. In no small part, thanks to Andrews, an informal alliance exists between the SATLC and the more radical left-wing groups in South Africa, most notably the ICU and the ISL. Despite these schisms within both Labour Party and their broader left over the merits of recognizing the syndicalist ICU, it currently seems that though the SATLC remains on the side of the unified proletariat of all colors, even though the disgruntlement among the white workers is becoming more and more apparent as the years pass. Okay, but again, we're not going to be going for any of these guys up here. We're not going to be going any kind of, like, socialist route. What are our factions? We have our national spears. We have negative 5% political gain. We cannot join any wars. We have bad stability and horrible war support. And political power gain, plus 20%. Terrible recruitment. Horrible stability and pretty bad uh, production efficiency cap. Fantastic. So we'd like to try to get those fixed up when we can. The International Socialist League. Now that in 1915, the International Socialist League is the primary syndicalist group operating in South Africa and is established in the neighboring territories of German and Portuguese colonial empires. It has established branches all across of South Africa and formed the first bl uh, black African trade union in the country, the Industrial Workers of Africa, in September of 1917. It also formed a number of other unions uh, among people of color, uh, while the leaders of the organization itself are mainly drawn from the rad uh, radical wing of the white working class, the Industrial Workers of Africa, founded with their help, would merge into the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, which has substantial black, African, colored, and Indian membership. While the South African Labour Party has remained apart from the ISL due to the more progressive stance on race relations, more radical members push for reconciliation. In the meanwhile, the ISL and the affiliates in the ICU campaigned for political reform in South Africa and organized resistance to the worst uh, ex uh, excesses Van Goren commits against the native population in Middle Africa. So stability is just constantly going down lower and lower and lower and lower. Okay, we're being invited to the Imperial Conference. We're not going to read these events. These are bog standard for any Antana Line country. So let's see, has anything else changed? I mean, we do see that Austria, all the little puppet states are now white as well. So that's one change. But I think other than that, like, there's nothing too, too crazy, I believe. I think Uruguay might be a different color, but maybe that's just me. Black money sits in South Africa. 
A week ago, the German stock market collapsed, plunging the world into depression. Since the advent of the Great Depression of 1925, the PAC government in power at the time, a coalition of National Party and the Labour Party, a smaller party of chiefly English-speaking white miners elected to deepen trade ties with the still prosperous Germany to limit the effects of the crisis will limit its success. The Smut Rose government that came to power in 1929 kept these arrangements in place, and as such, the Wolves of Black Monday did not escape South Africa. The crisis had a terrible effect upon the South African economy. Unemployment has risen marketably, as many companies that depended upon the German export market have gone out of business or laid off white workers in favor of cheaper native labor. What are we doing? Right now we're doing uh, the SABC. Stability, war support. We get radio for free. You know, that's actually, that's not bad. I'll definitely take it. So once you're finished, we will immediately go for the response to Black Monday. We probably want to go for the Consolidation Act. I believe. I know one of these brings about the Socialists, but I don't remember exactly which one it is. Just after this gold, 5%, not bad. I mean, a resource slot right away is also pretty good. And you're for military expansion. I don't think that's going to be a top priority for this government. Because, I mean, we're not going to be really going to war with too, too many people, I think. Okay. We're almost at 100 political power again. You guys, I think, are 150. You're also 150 now. Okay, so these have gone back up. These used to be 100 each. They're now up to 150, so they've definitely changed uh, some more stuff here. What about you? Just a small amount of gain, naval doctrine cost. Schmutz is hired elsewhere, is he? Do you think because he's a field marshal, I can't make him? No, okay, he's... Where's he? I, okay, so he's... The Prime Minister, I think? I know there was, I think, yeah. Yeah, you're the second in command. Okay, so because you're doing that, you're not allowed to be our military guy. That's fine. Um, so you could just, I mean, 5% reduction on everything, a little bit of base gain. You know, I'll take it. I, I think that seems completely acceptable. The Industrious Lobby. In the first decade of the Dominion, South Africa's political system had been made up out of the African-led South Africa party and a smaller British-led Unionist party. The party of the English-speaking mining magnates, the likes of Cecil Rhodes and letter star Jameson. When the National Party rose and Republican sentiments along with it, in combination with the Union's decline, they eventually agreed to merge into the South African Party. This SAP wing has persisted during the last 15 years. Standing in their way of political and economic dominance, however, is the Industrial Consolidation Act. This legislation as was passed by Herzog Coalition Government, the later party in 1924, and which was later upheld by Smut's SAP government. The act was intended to promote peace throughout the Union, healing the scars of the Rand Revolt, and serving as the foundation for a future South African welfare state. He legalized trade unions and granted them government recognition, on the condition that their activities would be moderated, and a period of uh, consolidation between employee and employer would be imposed in the event of labor struggles, with mediation from the Ministry of Labor before strikes could legally be launched by a union. This bargaining process also excluded black workers from unions, the hope of elevating the position of white laborers and sowing racial discord among the left. Though some informal arrangements exist where white workers have uh, uh, have argued on behalf of their black colleagues, the act ensure, ensures that blacks have hitherto, or hitherto, have been recognized as actual employees. There's turned out to be a double-edged sword, as while it suppressed the revolutionary left, it also granted white workers immense influence during the British Revolution and their subsequent rate of passion. Or the corporation to raise wages and guarantee jobs for whites at a time when many in the industrial lobby were desperate to switch to cheaper black labor and keep wages low to avoid inflation. The lobby has also openly decried that the vast concessions granted by the Industrial Consolidation Act will make the effective recovery from current Black Monday crisis next to impossible. With many of its members beginning are begging us to repeal the act in order to keep the inflation down, maintain foreign investments, and prevent the exodus of capital from Anglo-run industries. Union sympathizers and our parliamentary group expect us to repeal the Consolidation Act. Yes, we can do that. Do we... Okay, Cynic is taking over Australia. You are... Yeah, so Mexico's gone totalist. That's completely okay. That just means you're basically not going to be in the uh, international, which completely works out in our favor in the long run. So I'm, I'm okay allowing that to, to be for, for now. Track Canadian investments. 
Not given the demands. Current rule of the party. Social democratic. Social liberal. Market liberal. Conservative. Because right now we are the South African party. We're not the nationalist party. Okay. The Imperial Conference is 36. British delegation has spoken. I don't know if we get to make a demand here. Yes, we can. Cheaper industry, consumer goods, construction speed. Probably want to go for construction speed, I think. For right now. There we go. It also gives us... I mean, 10% consumer goods reduction is pretty nice as well. Yeah, so let's repeal you. Again, we should... I'm actually going to save here just in case I screw this up somehow. Because I think these events matter a lot when it comes to this event working in our favor. We have just tabled our proposed repeal of the Industrial Consolidation Act of 1924. The National's opposition has decried us as proving to be sock puppets of Hergenheimer once more. Right to the personification of English-speaking capitalists in cartoons in the African newspaper, Die Burger, and a small labor contingent normally divided between a national council and Cresswell faction, had joined them unanimously in condemning our suggestion. But this ladders little, as the SAP holds the majority of the Volkstrad. More ominous in the situation in the streets, the International Socialist League has condemned our motion and has called for a general strike. Not everyone is inclined to follow the rabble rousing, but several large mines in Volkswagen's land is completely locked down. For the owners, this may ha be a setback that cannot be overcome in combination with the crisis. If we do not act soon. So, no matter what, we're gonna have, we're gonna have strikes. Send in the strike breakers. At least, at least for right now. Okay. The sin and Senate strike breakers seem to inflame the situation. The strikers assaulted the trucks loaded with, with their replacements, leading to police intervention, which in turn developed into a riot. The Rand mining town of Boni, uh, which has been also been a hotspot in the 922 revolt, armed rioters have forced the police to retreat from the town entirely. While elsewhere, the town of Brixpad and several suburbs of Johannesburg, rioters have taken control block by block. To make matters worse, new to the brutalities have reached outside of Rand, and strikes in solidarity with them are being called among dog workers in Durban and Cape Town. The scope of the crisis is quickly growing. Meet the one in 1922. What are you? The rise of the Regiment of Stone. Disturbing news from the coal mining town of Ermelo and the Transvaal has arrived. A group of armed Zulu men have attacked the local bank and taken uh, away into the Dragspar Mountains what were supposed to be the wages for the miners. Boys are reports from eyewitnesses of robbers claim to be a continuance of the Nivides, a historical fear, historically feared gang which lost much of their provenance, at least outside of the prisons as a unified entity. Following her leader, Nuglo's disavowed following and encouragement of the authorities. Very cool, very cool. So we're at least going to wait until we're past this crisis to end this episode. Okay, we're gonna do another save here. The crisis is quickly growing and even starts to exceed the problems of 1922. Unlike back then, revolting workers have also securing ever-increasing control over Durban and Cape Town. In Johannesburg, the majority of the city has fallen under worker control. In Pretoria, panic among factionaries is rising in parallel between drama between a mining strike in Wales in 1935 and the one that has caused the crisis. Prime Minister Smuts remain calm under the circumstances, however, arguing that unlike in Britain, these white strikers have very little ability to protect power into the South African hinterland. The cabinet debates two options, sending in the military immediately, which would quickly pass through the crisis like in 1922, but would likely come at a large cost of lives on both sides, or use the military purely as a defensive ma uh, manner, which would undoubtedly end the strikers' advance, allowing us to isolate them. We can hardly maintain the position for long, and will hopefully surrender. Okay, let's see if we can isolate them for now. Maybe that'll work, maybe it won't. By the way, what happened in Afghanistan? Did we win? Okay. We did end up winning there, which is nice. We also have response to Black Monday. I didn't even realize that this was an option for us. 30% employment, 0% inflation. 402 million pounds of the gold standard. Tariffs. There we go. Spent 2 million pounds on that. That's, that should be okay. Hopefully it'll be okay. Okay, but are you going to have any more decisions? You know, there might not be any more decisions. I think for right now, we're actually going to end it here. So thanks everybody for watching. My name is Anthony. If you enjoyed, put a thumbs up. Now, enjoy, call you some down. You want to see me subscribe, and goodbye.